Of Pelagre, there are seven swords. The one that makes you mad. The one that drags you to water. The one that pulls you over backwards. The one that hunches you forward. The one that makes you dizzy. The one that makes you hungry. The one that makes you peel and screw. In this period, which could be defined as fortunate, the rural family possessed some portion of land and enjoyed the fruits of propriety, and the workers on lands owned by others attained adequate benefits, because the product of the soil which they watered with their own sweat benefited only the owners and themselves. Now this is not the case anymore. The peasant who are owners are few, very few, and the products of the soil are normally shared by the landlord, the tenant farmer and then the worker. The peasant is considered as nothing more than a mechanical instrument, a rake, a plowshare, a plough. Nothing is left for the poor peasant than an insufficient portion of polenta. The peasant's dwellings are dank, in poor repair, badly ventilated, without a floor, often roofed in straw, in which a large number of people live. In the countryside, say from a few wealthy families, yellow flour is the only food they have no other nutritious food. The patient is Domenico G. of Feltre Belluno. In the spring of 1861, Domenico had peeling on the back of his hands, his ankle and the top of his chest. The following autumn, Domenico fell into delirium. On the 23rd of March, 1862, because he tried to flee from his family and tend them towards act of dangerous to his own existence, he was brought and admitted into this asylum. Domenico has desperate, unceasing, clamorous delirium. He thinks he's irredeemably damned and would like to take his own life. The town of Pedavena, through its town physician, declares the diseased state of Maria P, 26. Maria has had more or less light attacks of insanity every year from 1878 towards springtime. This latest attack appeared on the 26th of March last. 25th January 1882. He is 54, a peasant, married, a father of three, wretched. For about a year, he has been complaining of headaches, chest and stomach pains. He staggers all the time, so he cannot be left alone. He threatens himself and others. His diet is exclusively maize polenta. The cause is the disease of poverty, endemic pellagra. In his miserable hovel, the pellegrin preferred to lie on the bare earth. His yellow-reddish skin peels and falls off in shreds. His mouth is one single ulcer. His tongue cracked and bloody. His body finds no relief in any position. The desperate scream that comes from his tired and swollen throat, sounding more like a sinister roar than a human voice, spread throughout the neighborhood. This is the picture offered by Pellagra. What remedy could it be for such a harrowing state of affairs? News bulletin from the province of Pederoba. Pellagra is increasing at a frightening rate. And we, the poor inhabitants of the town of Pederoba, convinced that a single deed is worth more than a hundred scientific discussions, today got together to take concrete steps towards setting up a soup kitchen for pellegrins. I'm up against on the one hand government indifference to whatever is not in the political interest and scant attention paid to our public health officials. On the other hand, the stubbornness of peasant, the indifference of philanthropists, the selfish complicity of the landowners and the meagre authority of rural doctors. Pellagra is not caused by poverty, but rather by a virus containing spoiled cord. However, 
the virus is more virulent when debilitated by poverty. This means that advising peasants to eat and drink better to protect them from pellagra is meaningful. But it's a useless truth, a cruel irony that may even be harmful. While physicians like Lombroso debated the causes and cure of pellagra, the damaging effects of the disease raged on in the countryside. During the winter months, many rural families survived just on maize polenta. The result of years with no access to a nutritional diet was pellagris insanity, stage 3 of the disease. The provincial councils, the aristocracy and the government together seemed unable to solve the growing problem of pellagra. For those suffering from pellagris insanity, their only other hope was admittance to San Clemente or San Servolo, the insane asylums of Venice. The mental hospital is no longer a prison, no longer a sepulchre for the living. It is no longer even a place of segregation, but an asylum, a source of relief, a clinic. It is itself a most effective means of treatment. New arrivals are placed in an observation ward where they remain for two weeks before being placed in the respective section according to the dictates of psychiatry. 11th of February 1877. She is 49, a married peasant with no children. She is Catholic. Intellectual aptitude limited. She has only received religious instructions. She is an housewife. Form of insanity. Melancholy. Mutism or almost. Tendency to immobility. Incoherent ideas of being damned. Suicide attempts. She seems engrossed in a fixed idea. She spends all day alone, crouched in a corner of the room, with her hands in her hair, which she sometimes tears out. She seems overcome by terrible ideas and sometimes she demonstrates a fear of being killed. Pellagra can present itself in all forms, beginning with cheerful mania to mania with frenzy, from simple depression to melancholy with stupor, to mania with persecution, to hypochondriacal, sensory and paralytical insanity. We have the occasion to observe it in all these forms. March 1877. A state of anxious melancholy with suicidal tendencies continues. April 1877. A health good, but a phrenopathic form shows no improvement. She tears her hair out and rails against herself. In the day room at the end of the corridor, a perfect pandemonium existed. Fifty women were fastened down in various ways. Straps, jackets, hobbles, and their feet were blue with cold. The crying and howling were dreadful. I noticed in the laundry several leather-coloured fetters hanging up and I was informed that if a patient refused to work, these replied to fastening her to the tub stand. May, no improvement. June, health fair. 29th of July. I was cold when the lace had been removed. Her neck showed the deep signs and bruising caused by the news. Her whole body was still warm. By force of movements, she managed to undo her straight jackets and so had been able to carry out the suicidal act which she has so long run over in her mind. We try to activate artificial respiration. 
All attempts to re-establish heart movement and breathing failed. Around 8 p.m. we stopped when her extremities had become cold. Signed, Brunetta. Ergotherapy serves to focus the mind away from the delirious thought. At San Clemente, we have textile mills and spinning looms. Patients are involved in needlework and lace making, as well as cooking, baking, washing, gardening and animal husbandry. For the majority of the Pelagris insane, the asylums proved an effective cure. The strict diet was far more nutritious than the polenta they were so used to surviving on. For the rural people of northern Italy, working conditions began to improve, and wheat was more readily available. Without any real intervention from government, Pelagra eventually began to decline. Malaria and Pelagra, the two false scourge and shame of Italy. So we are ourselves acknowledged and so foreigners define us. But these two hills have been silently diminishing ever since Italy was united and become to gather strength. Why remain silent about these changes? Two great victories for our country?